morning, booktube. This is Margaret. Thanks for coming to my channel. And it's after the election now, but we're still not done. So let's try to go on with our lives while we wait for the count to continue. Yes. Today's video is going to be a dramatic reading. I think I'm going to do one of these a month because they're fun and they're letting me practice my acting chops. Sort of. And it's a little peek into what I'm reading because uh, for today's dramatic reading, I will be choosing several passages from The Warden by Anthony Trollope. Trollope was a favorite with some of the Victober participants, and I am not reading him for Victober, I'm reading him for a buddy read in November. So I'm doing that with Carrie from Caring for Books on November 22nd. We'll have a live chat. We will be reading Barchester Towers, and I'm reading the prequel to that, The Warden, uh, right now. So I'm thoroughly enjoying that. And uh, yeah, I marked out some passages. Um, I've got the book from the library. It's a very <laughs> old school copy. Um, first published in 1855, and the library book is an interesting thing. The flyleaf was missing, so they, like, cut and glued something in. It's very interesting. This is a 1962 edition, printed in Great Britain. I love, I love looking at old books and seeing how they were put together, oddly, sometimes. Anyway, Trollope, the Warden, the Do You Need Any Background? The Warden is a person called Mr. Harding, and he's a church official called a precentor, and he's also in charge of this, like, old men's home for 12 men, and there's a certain amount of money set aside to care for them, but he gets a lot more money to care for them than they get being cared for, so there's this controversy that's come up about whether he deserves it, and he's... Uh, as he considers himself a very pious man, so he's having a hard time going over this. But his son-in-law is also a church official and has no qualms at all and thinks he's totally entitled and is rather a stick in the mud and a rah-rah-rah type person. And um, so this is talking about that rah-rah-rah archdeacon persona. And uh, it was talking about uh, his wife, so his, the archdeacon and his wife at home. He has discussed the matter with his all-trusted helpmate, his wife, within that sacred recess formed by the clerical bed curtains at Plumstead Episcopi. That's his house name. How much sweet solace, how much valued counsel has our archdeacon received within that sainted closure? Tis there alone that he unbends and comes down from his high church pedestal to the level of a mortal man. In the world, Dr. Grantley never lays aside that demeanor which so well becomes him. He has all the dignity of an ancient saint with the sleekness of a modern bishop. He is always the same. He is always the archdeacon. Unlike Homer, he never nods. Even with his father-in-law, even with the bishop and dean, he maintains that sonorous tone and lofty deportment which strikes awe into the young hearts of Barchester and absolutely cows the whole parish of Plumstead Episcopi. Tis only when he has exchanged that ever-new shovel hat for a tasseled nightcap, and those shining black habiliments for his accustomed robe de nuit, that Dr. Grantly talks and looks and thinks like an ordinary man. <laughs> Alright, there's more that's funny, but I will leave that for a taste of the... Uh, ecclesiastical comedy that Trollope dips into, which is very funny. The tasseled nightcap makes me think especially of Hannah's books, because I think she had some headwear for Victober that was, like, nightgown-related that made me think of that. Anyway, second passage. Uh, Dr. Grantley visits the hospital. This is also the same rah-rah-rah uh, archdeacon character. Though doubt and hesitation disturbed the rest of our poor warden, no such weakness perplexed the nobler breast of his son-in-law. As the indomitable cock preparing for the combat sharpens his spurs, shakes his feathers, and erects his comb, so did the archdeacon arrange his weapons for the coming war, without misgiving and without fear. 
that he was fully confident of the justice of his cause, let no one doubt. Many a man can fight his battle with good courage, but with a doubting conscience. Such was not the case with Dr. Grantley. He did not believe in the gospel with more assurance than he did in the sacred justice of all ecclesiastical revenues. When he put his shoulder to the wheel to defend the income of the present and future presenters of Barchester, he was animated by as strong a sense of a holy cause as that which gives courage to any missionary in Africa, or enables a sister of mercy to give up the pleasures of the world for the wards of a hospital. He was about to defend the holy of holies from the touch of the profane, to guard the citadel of his church from the most rampant of its enemies, to put on his good armor in the best of fights, and secure, if possible, the comforts of his creed for coming generations of ecclesiastical dignitaries. Such a work required no ordinary vigor, and the archdeacon was, therefore, extraordinarily vigorous. It demanded a buoyant courage, and a heart happy in its toil, and the archdeacon's heart was happy, and his courage was buoyant. <laughs> I, maybe this is not supposed to be as funny as it sounds to me now, but maybe, I don't know. P bigger trollop scholars can weigh in and tell me uh, if they were as tickled this by this as I was. Okay, so the next one is about the Jupiter. The Jupiter is a newspaper. It's like a tittle-tattle political sheet. And um, the warden has been talked about. And, you know, the case is being thrown into the media. And he is so ashamed that he's being talked about as someone who is undeserving. And his sort of standing has come down in the world. And the archdeacon, the bishop, and the warden are talking about what they should do about this article that came out uh, accusing the church of uh misdeeds right to the jupiter suggested the bishop yes said the archdeacon more worldly wise than his father yes and be smothered with ridicule tossed over and over again with scorn shaken this way and that as a rat in the mouth of a practiced terrier you will leave out some word or letter in your answer and the ignorance of the cathedral clergy will be harped upon you will make some small mistake, which will be a falsehood, or some admission, which will be self-condemnation. You will find yourself to have been vulgar, ill-tempered, irreverent, and illiterate, and the chances are ten to one, but that being a clergyman, you will have been guilty of blasphemy. A man may have the best of causes, the best of talents, and the best of tempers. He may write as well as Addison, or as strongly as Junius, but even with all this, he cannot successfully answer when attacked by the Jupiter. In such matters, it is omnipotent. What the Tsar is in Russia, or the mob in America, that the Jupiter is in England. Answer such an article. No, Warden, whatever you do, don't do that. We were to look for this sort of thing, you know, but we need not draw down on our heads more of it than is necessary. <laughs> and that is actually, you know, still pretty true. I don't know, how does that hold up in your neck of the woods? We've got some interesting media strategy going on in the U.S. right now. Perhaps I shouldn't comment on that. All right, last one that I tagged here. These are these are a godsend. If anyone hasn't seen these before, they're reusable at least a couple times. They're transparent, and they come off books very easily, so you don't get residue. All right. And now this last one is... Oh, yes. This last one is, again, about the Archdeacon character. It's talking about his family life and how he and his wife were disagreeing about something in the bedroom, but then they come out for breakfast and, like, he's back to that same persona of I'm always right. So this is a little, like, political family commentary that Trollope slips in. Whatever of submissive humility may have appeared in the gait and visage of the Archdeacon during his colloquy with his wife, in the sanctum of their dressing rooms, was dispelled as he entered his breakfast parlor with erect head and powerful step. In the presence of a third person, he assumed the lord and master. And that wise and talented lady too well knew the man to whom her lot for life was bound, to stretch her authority beyond the point at which it would be born. 
Strangers at Plumstead Episcopi, when they saw the imperious brow with which he commanded silence from the large circle of visitors, children, and servants who came together in the morning to hear him read the word of God, and watched how meekly that wife seated herself behind her basket of keys with a little girl on each side as she caught that commanding glance. Strangers, I say, seeing this, could little guess that some fifteen minutes since she had stoutly held her ground against him, hardly allowing him to open his mouth in his own defense. But such is the tact and talent of women! <laughs> ah, Yes, so we'll finish on that high note, the tact and talent of women. Oh, what else? I just did a ridiculous book haul, and I think I'm going to share it with you in a video because I did it to help support a local bookstore that is scrambling. I will put the link down below and if you can go on her Instagram and order a book, she would be very grateful to stay in business in Portland. What else is going to come? I am thinking of a holiday book sale inspired by Ilum Reed's channel. So that'll be on the Keening. I want to do a video about uh, another well, not sale, but charity. So, Dulcie's Legacy, my second book, is a YA book involving a girl going into high school, a 200-year-old Scottish settler, and a Mi'kmaq Indian girl. Mi'kmaq First Nation girl, we would say now. It's a time travel sort of mystery. So, I did some research into the Mi'kmaq very, very little. It's like six years ago, but they're in my head as a people who occupy that space. And so when I saw the conflict come up on TikTok of all places, I was made aware of this conflict between the lobster fishermen and the Mi'kmaq fishermen that's going on. And it's less of a conflict and more of like a bullying episode. I, I've been thinking about that and I'm going to do a donate all the Dulcie's legacy revenue to that cause. Um, I'll put that information down below uh, and make a video about that pretty soon. And the book birthday. Reminder, I'm still looking for clips for people talking about their feelings of home, homecoming, longing for home, connection to place. That feels really important right now. And um, hopefully if you think about it for a few minutes and give me 60 seconds of commentary about your feelings, it will make you feel grounded and more connected to the people that surround you and that will help with any anxiety you may be feeling if you're in the United States for, I don't know, some reason? Yeah. Um, so yeah, videos to come, clips to send, sales to go on, and stay safe out there. Thanks for watching. See you soon.